Hey, welcome to another edition of Boxing Info. I'm your host, Guy Allender, and this is the Results Show week ending April the 26th. Got a lot to cover here today, so let's get right to it. Um, Friday Night Fights on the 24th in Chicago on ESPN, Antonio Escalante scored a third round T TKO over Gary Stark Jr. Um, you know, I was a little bit surprised about this. I, I kind of guess I. Some of these matches that they make on ESPN are made to actually go over some distance. And this was not one that I would expect an early knockout in or an early stoppage, but it uh, actually did happen. Um, a good win for Escalante. Um, you know, I was kind of flipping in and out of the channels and really didn't get a chance to uh, watch the follow-up or watch the in-between fights. I think Dan Raphael was in the studio for ESPN. Enough about that. We've already wasted too much time. All right, uh, same night on Showtime. Uh, their B grade uh, programming. Devin Alexander scored a ninth round TKO over Jesus Rodriguez. Um, Rodriguez took a knee, took the count, but uh, Alexander, he's still making a transition from prospect to contender. I think he's like uh, the WBC number one contender, and I'm not sure he's really ready yet for. Uh, for a title shot, I just you know against Timothy Bradley. I mean Timothy Bradley's come a long way in a short period of time, and I don't I'm not so sure that Devin Alexander is ready for that. Uh, in the main event, Corey Spinks again gets by by a whisker basically against DeAndre Lattimore, in which he was drilled to the canvas in the first round, cut, and if it wasn't for Lattimore kind of slowing down towards the end, I don't think Spinks would have won this fight. Uh, and personally, I thought I could have seen the fight going for Lattimore. Um, just me. Uh, Spinks will have this title until another young fighter comes around, or a very active fighter, and knocks him off. Uh, what was next on? Um, I don't know how I'm going to do this, because this is a lot to do. In Bayamon, Puerto Rico, on the 25th, Juan Ma Lopez successfully defended his WBO 122 pound belt for the third time in a rising battle with Jerry Penalosa. Now understand, I couldn't find a round to give Jerry Penalosa, and when uh, you think through nine rounds, Lopez landed 440 something punches on Penalosa, but the really alarming thing here is that Penalosa scored with over 25 percent, 24 or 25 percent of his shots on Lopez. Now understand, Lopez was coming forward. I did never expect that this fight be fought at the range of a sport. I thought that Lopez would, you know, bomb away from the outside or wait in, or wait in and it would be, you know, you know, if he got it done, it would be done from the outside, but I never thought that he'd stand straight in front of Penalosa and, and just let Penalosa swing away at him as well. Although Lopez was throwing regularly 110 plus punches around in any event, and Penalosa was just too small and too outgunned. And, you know, the HBO was talking about, you know, that Lopez is, is very big for the weight and very strong. You know, it's something we've seen before. I mean, think about it. Wilfredo Gomez had a, was a lot bigger and stronger than the rest of the 122 pounders. He was too big to be a bantamweight, and really he's a little bit too small to be a, a, a real featherweight. And he was really big for this weight class. And I just uh, think it's going to be the same thing for Lopez, although I think he will perform better at featherweight when he decides to go there. Um, great win for him. Uh, he's quickly rising up the... Uh, the pound for pound rankings. I'm not sure if he's, you can consider him cracking the top 10 yet, but he's getting up there. Great win for him. Penalosa, great show. Um, you know, Freddie Roach did the right thing stopping the fight. He was taking way too many shots, and, and you really didn't know it until after the fight was stopped and you saw the damage that was done to his face with the, the bruising and the, and the, you know, those were like impact breaks of the skin around his eyes. I mean, it was like incre incredible shot, shot making by uh, Juan Manuel Lopez. I really wish he'd fight Celestino Caballero and just, I want to see Caballero tested like there's no end. All right, Mash and Tucker, Connecticut on Showtime going against this card. Carl Frosch versus Jermaine Taylor, and i got to spend a little bit of time on this because, you know, you got to love when a fight ends like this, and I could be wrong about the prediction. Who gives a crap? I mean, but the fact of the matter is, this guy comes from England, brings his title over here, all the cards are stacked against him, gets a little wild in the fight, gets himself hurt and knocked down in the third round. I have Taylor slightly ahead, just like Al Bernstein did, going into the last round. 
and Taylor's stupid corner tells him he needs to win the round big to win the fight, and what does he do? Gets careless, gets caught, gets rocked across the ring, and finally he dropped. I, swear, I have no idea how he got up when he got knocked down in the 12th round. But Frosch did what he had to do, went in and finished him. And he, here's what I'm going to say about this. This is a microcosm of Jermaine Taylor's career. All in this one fight. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Because there's extraordinary talent, but on the other hand, God help him if title fights were still 15 rounds. I mean, he can't even get through 12 rounds, barely. And at the same time, I said in the preview show, he was either going to underestimate Frosch's speed, which he didn't really do, or the fact that Frosch is a really big, strong guy, and Taylor is not used to fighting guys his size or bigger, because he, he was fed a steady diet of junior middleweights leading up to his fight with Bernard Hopkins. And you think about it. When was the last time Jermaine Taylor scored a stoppage victory at the world-class level? It was before his fights with Hopkins. It's been a long time. To me, he's about finished. I mean, it's just... This is what I get, I get really mad about with HBO force-feeding us a certain guy. Now, they didn't televise this fight, obviously, but they were. All right, good win for Carl Frosch. I hope better things for him down the road. All right, schedule for this week. Celestino Caballero is taking on Jeffrey Mathabula in Panama City on April 30th to defend his WBA and IBF 122-pound unified title. Mathabula, talented South African, they're the people we kind of leave out of the mix. We're always arguing about, you know, Mexican fighters, the you know, European fighters, the British fighters, Americans, Asians, and we always forget them, and they're very good athletes. And I hope that Mathabula actually tests Caballero. I don't think it's going to probably go his way down in Panama City, but we'll see. May 1st, Las Vegas on Azteca America TV, Urbano Antillian. Headlines a card against Tyrone Harris in a 10-round, 135-pound fight. Expect Antillian to score a stoppage somewhere along the middle rounds. Alfonso Gomez also on the card, making his comeback. May 2nd, Las Vegas. Really quick, on the card, Abner Marez will be fighting. Mike Alvarado, who represents Golden Boy. Mike Alvarado, representing top rank. Humberto Soto defending his title, representing top rank. And in the main event, Ricky Hatton's taking on Manny Pacquiao. Now listen, before everybody gets their panties in the wad, let me tell you my prediction. Pacquiao's going to win this fight decisively. Pacquiao's going to win this fight because no matter what Floyd Mayweather teaches Hatton, I don't see him teaching him any defensive skills. And he's moving in half the speed that everybody else I've seen that does those exercises with Floyd Mayweather. Not that that's going to mean anything this fight. I really think that Ricky Hatton is a world-class great fighter, but Manny Pacquiao is an all-time great fighter. And there's a big difference between those two. A huge difference between those two. And what's going to happen is either Pacquiao's going to win a clear-cut decision or he's going to stop Ricky Hatton somewhere in the middle, middle of the fight. But at the same time, there is a danger that Hatton can win the fight. It's not like I'm saying Hatton has no chance. So all you British people, don't get all up, up in arms. The fact of the matter is Pacquiao has been vulnerable to the body a long time in his past when he was draining himself to make weight. And in his last fight with Marquez, he was hurt really bad to the body. Hatton's going to have to walk through fire like he, like he had done against Costa Zoo to get this job done. I just don't see it going that way. I just think the speed, the foot movement, Pacquiao's best defense are two things. His offense and his feet. Just moving side to side. Not running away or backing up, just moving side to side. And that's going to be enough to get him by Ricky Hatton, I feel. Um, what they need to do to win the fight, Pacquiao just fights his fight. Hatton's going to have to walk through a myriad of punches and get to the body. It's the only thing he can do, to, I think he can do to win this fight. Um, there was something else I was going to cover on this as I was rushing through it, and it's kind of slipped my mind now about, you know, I really think, and this is just coming from my point of view in editorial, that it would be better for boxing if Pacquiao wins the fight, because I want to see Pacquiao and Mayweather get it on if that's meant to be, or Pacquiao fighting these other bigger fights. Mayweather's not going to fight Hatton a rematch. Um, I, I don't care what Floyd Mayweather Sr. says, it just ain't going to happen. And I, in any event, um, I really think that uh, this could either be a showcase fight for Pacquiao or it's going to be a, you know, 
a, a terrible disappointment for one of the two sides. Let's hope for a good fight. And I know what I was going to actually say. My really question of the week is this, and this is what I keep asking myself. It's not who's going to win this fight. It's whether or not Hatton will be more competitive than De La Hoya or David Diaz. Can he present the problems that Juan Manuel Marquez or other fighters in the past have presented? Specifically, um, that Sanchez guy, who Agapito Sanchez, who was kind of a dirty fighter. And I think in order to get to Pacquiao, you kind of have to be a little bit on the shady side. So that's going to do it for this show. I'll be back. Results next week, everybody.